So previously I discussed the rising rates of mental illness in westernized cultures. I get into this in a whole lot more depth in my upcoming book, a Jungian analysis of toxic modern culture. And all the studies that I'm discussing here are going to be available in that book that you'll be able to look them up. Book is available for pre-order link is in the description. So all that said, now what, how do we know, that worsening anxiety and depression in Western nations is actually due to modernization or modern lifestyle, as I am claiming. How do we know that it's their culture is becoming more toxic rather than maybe some huge global increase in depression? <clears throat> Can we say that it's unique to culture, to our culture and cultures like it, or what Westernized nations? Maybe there's modern, there's factors about our modern lifestyle that are toxic as compared to, say, hunter-gatherer societies. It might be a worsening of mental health overall. Well, there was an interesting review that I get into in my book by a researcher named Hidaka in a 2012 in-depth review of this particular question. And what he notes in that, him and his team, are that there are a number of factors that seem to connect the lifestyle of modern developed nations to these counterintuitive increases in depression, anxiety, and substance use, as well as self-harm behaviors. Um, and it's looked at specifically with cross-cultural studies. Now, yes, this is difficult type of studies to do because of methodological issues and different definitions of depression among different cultures and so forth. Nevertheless, we do have some data on this. And the interesting thing about this is that the anthropological reports and the comparisons that we have strongly suggest that depression really doesn't seem to exist in hunter-gatherer societies. Very interesting. Now, this there's an important caveat here. We're talking about hunter-gatherer and indigenous populations that have been unperturbed by Western nations' oppression and interference. That's it's very well known that those kinds of societies have very high rates of mental illness. And but then the cause in that case is quite obvious. If people would have left them alone and probably would have been fine. Nevertheless, there are very low rates of depression among unperturbed foragers that comes from a number of different studies across several decades in the last century. Um, of different societies in Indonesia and Africa. And what they what they found what they found was that modernization often corresponds almost inevitably corresponds to a huge increase in depression and, and self-harm rates, sometimes tripling in a single decade when you see the changes associated with going from a so-called primitive lifestyle to a modern industrialized lifestyle. So Another example of this is a study by Shepard and Rode in 1996. They were looking at the Ik of Uganda, and it's kind of sad, really. They saw this dramatic increase in depression over a relatively short period of time as the culture changed. Okay, but what other evidence? So, so there's other evidence gathered by Hidaka in his review. And an interesting way of testing this is to take a look at things that are identified as so-called signifiers of so-called primitive cultures. Okay, so like um, hunting and gathering, belief in magic, agricultural, technological simplicity. When you compare those along different lines, I mean, across cultures, what do you find is a correlation between, the, between those practices and beliefs and low rates of depression. For example, when rural and urban Nigerians were compared to rural and urban Canadian and American women along these modernization scales, they found that the degree of modernization correlated very strongly with depression rates and in a dose dependent manner. So the more modernization you had, the more depression you had. That seems pretty disturbing to me. Still more evidence of modernization correlating with increased depression, self-harm, and anxiety come from studies of Mexicans adopting an American lifestyle and Chinese before and after massive cultural changes that occurred in the early 20th century. 
even comparing rural and urban populations in the same country. They found a link between uh, feelings of meaningfulness in life and subjective happiness. And this appears to have been hit hard by so-called progress. In other words, the overall goal of meaningful in, meaningfulness in life seems to have declined dramatically uh, along many different cultures and including these. Trust in others is another area that seems to have declined it as well, um, but we can get into that elsewhere. Um, long story short, any one of these observations alone would not necessarily be all that impressive, but what is impressive and also highly concerning is the sheer number of these studies. And I get into quite a few more of these in, in my book. And they all seem to point to the same conclusion that the modern Western increasingly urbanized lifestyle is actually mentally toxic. And it's not toxic in an overt manner. Of course, if you are raised in it, you don't know any different. So you just figure it must be normal. But when you look cross generation, generationally and cross culturally, you see it is increased. It is associated with increased anxiety, depression, addictions, and self harm behavior. Hidaka finishes the review with some very fascinating and concerning observations. I'll, I'll quote him here uh, at the end of this, um, at the end of his report. I'll, I'll quote what he says here: "More money." does not lead to more happiness. Okay, no shocker there. By appealing to evolutionary pro proclivities like a desire for energy-dense food and status competition, the economic and marketing forces of modern society have engineered an environment promoting decisions that maximize consumption at the long-term cost of well-being. In effect, humans have dragged a body with a long hominid history into an overfed, malnourished, sedentary, sunlight deficient, sleep deprived, competitive, equitable, inequitable, and socially isolating environment with dire consequences. Now in medicine and in psychology, we often talk about the so-called biopsychosocial model of Engel and Romano. And what I've noticed, and I've mentioned this before, but I think it's worth reiterating here again, that generally what we focus on are the bio, is the bio and the psycho. So we look at, okay, medications, your genetic predispositions, so forth and so on. That's the bio piece. And then we look at psycho, the psychological, the psycho part of that uh, biopsychosocial model. And that's things like early attachment experiences, experiences with caregivers, early traumas, blah, 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 all that stuff. But what about the social? Generally, we tend to give that lip service and we'll say something around the lines of, you know, they're, they're pursuing this or that social category. They feel like that they're a part of this or that social category, so forth and so on. But that's not really what the model is supposed to be doing. The model is saying, what are the biological and psychological and social contributors to a given mental state or mental illness in our case? And what this stuff does, that what these studies that I've reviewed here with you, and I go in more depth in my book, seem to show is that there are significant social contributors because of the way that our society is and how it operates. It is making a major contribution to mental illness in and of itself. One of the barriers, I think, to accepting that fact is the longstanding belief in the so-called blank slate, which means there can't be a social contributor to mental illness because there's no expectation for culture to mismatch with if you have a blank slate. But we know that the blank slate is complete nonsense. It's absolutely false. And that there is a huge number of instincts that we come into the world expecting. And if they're not met, we suffer. And this is a great example. So there's your Mental Health Monday today. Make sure you subscribe uh, and then check out ericgoodwin.com. I got podcasts, other stuff you can't get here on YouTube. And until next time, See you then.